Donna. And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 150. Oh, shit. What? 150. You remember 50 episodes ago when we were like, holy fuck, 100? 150. Wow. Well, thank y'all for being here. I mean, some people have been here the whole time. Right? How are you not sick of us? We're sick of us. Well, the people who have been here for a while, they know that you're a changeling, and they have been tagging you in all the posts about that new Netflix show yes. that has a changeling, and I'm like, yes, at least they know that you are a changeling. I mean, they like, know the truth. how many people were like, there's a Netflix show about Carrie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I crack up every time I see it. Yeah, I watched it. It's really good, but hilarious. Hilarious. Well, there are some other people who are learning way too much about us. Patrioters! <laughs> so, thank you so much, Janine M. from Indiana. John R. from Arizona. Zoe B. from Iowa. Ariel H. from Texas. <gasps> Shelby S. from Texas. Monica G. from New Jersey. Tara D. from Washington. Brianna D. from Michigan. Rebecca B. from Australia. And Amanda J. from South Carolina. Thank y'all so much for joining Patreon. Um, y'all are going to get to know us, and you probably already have because you've been here a minute. Lots and lots of, well, TMI. Mm-hmm. Our extra slices reveal a lot about us, about our family, about... Well, all the things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you want all that, well, TMI... Head on over to patreon.com slash the APC podcast. I really think we sold it this time. I mean, <laughs> why would you not want to join? <laughs> so you're finally a little better. Yep. You don't sound like somebody's pinching your nose. Right. Yeah. And I am dry needle certified. Yes. The crowd goes wild. The course I went to was really freaking awesome. This guy, Luke, he owns the company and ran the course. He gets us. He's a creepster. All the things. So if you're for real, if you're a therapist who wants to do dry needling, I definitely suggest United Dry Needling Education because Luke is amazing. I will not be getting dry needling done ever. I, I didn't even. I, look, <laughs> I needed to practice in between week because it was two weekends. So like I went to Pensacola one weekend and then the next weekend because it was like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday course all day. Because a few states require like 50 plus hours of training for you to be certified. In the interim, I needed to practice. I knew who not to fucking ask. Mm-mm. Not me. And that was this one. Like, I didn't mm -mm. even, I didn't even, it wasn't even a thing. No. No, 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 no. It was like perfect timing, though, for me to be away at a course because you've been sick. So it was yeah. like perfect chill time for you to just like catch up on some rest Exactly. While I'm gone. Doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, yes. And this past weekend, I stayed in and did exactly that. Rested up. Like, slept a shit ton. Trying to get better. All that shit. And I binged shows. And, of course, I had to watch some of my Dybbuk douche. Because Heller. And I watched one of his series called Deadly Possessions. But it's called Ghost Adventures Artifacts on Hulu. So was he possessed? Because isn't he always possessed? He was not possessed on, on the one I saw. No, it was just the objects. Hmm. Mm hmm Not on brand for him. <laughs> well, he covered some of the objects I had talked about, like Robert the Doll, Peggy the Doll, in different episodes and stuff like that. But there was one that he did that I had never heard about, and it was pretty interesting, and it's called The Conjure Chest. And it's thought to be one of the most haunted and deadliest objects in the world. Or used to be, at least. Dun-dun-dun. Mm-hmm. So I want to tell you the story of The Conjure Chest. Picture it. Frankfort, Kentucky, somewhere between 1830 and 1840. There was this plantation owner, Jacob Cooley, and as you know, he was exactly what you think of when you think of a plantation owner. Mean, unjust, cruel, all the things. Well, he was also a husband and about to be a father to a baby boy. So in preparation for his son's birth, 
he got one of his slaves, Hosea, to build a chest of drawers for his boy's clothes. And the craftsmanship was amazing. It was beautiful. But Jacob, again, was cruel. And instead of just being thankful or not even saying anything, just like go back to doing your whatever, he brutally beat Hosea (gasps) to death. What? For doing a good job? Basically. Fuck him. He found something that he didn't like with it and used that as a reason. But the thing is, is he liked the chest of drawers. And I feel like he was just too proud and not even proud, just too too much of that. An asshole. Yes. To say he liked it or good job or whatever. Then don't say a fucking word. Just move on. Right. <gasps> oh. I feel like. That is that thin line that everyone had to walk back then if you were a slave. Like, you couldn't do too good of a job, but you couldn't do too bad of a job either Mm -hmm. because either way, you could get beat. Like, you can get beat for anything. You can get killed for anything Mm -hmm. because those people literally thought you were their property, and that's what the law said. Right. You know, it was like he was jealous that Hosea had... A skill that he didn't, Mm -hmm. you know, and was threatened by that. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, what he could do was beat him down and he took it too far. Yeah, assert his dominance and his power. Yeah. Fuck him. Right. Well, this was a turning point for all the other slaves on the plantation because they wanted justice for his death. So they turned to a local conjure man, allegedly, And so what he did was he sprinkled owl's blood and did this chant, thus placing this death curse on this chest of drawers. And it was like dried owl's blood. So it wasn't just like drips of blood on this chest of drawers. And like I said, Jacob liked the chest, so he did use it for his baby boy's clothes. Like, he killed Hosea and still used it. Well, unfortunately, his son died soon after his birth, like days after. And that chest was in his nursery, and he did have his clothes in it. Nothing was linked to the chest, because why would Jacob ever think someone would be, you know, powerful enough like him or what? You know, like, why would he Mm -hmm. think anything like that? So the chest was given to Jacob's brother and then moved into his son's room. And he was later stabbed to death by one of his servants. Oh, shit. Well, then Jacob had another son named John, and he inherited one of Jacob's plantations because, of course, Jacob had like, you know, 20 different fucking plantations. Gross. Yeah. So everything was good. Life was normal for Jacob. No tragedy. He met the love of his life named Ellie. And I don't know why, but the story loves to point out that Ellie was, like, much younger than John. And it doesn't really seem to make a difference in the story. But, like, she was younger, like, barely out of her teens. But also, I feel like that was the thing back in the day anyway. Well, barely out of her teens. Sorry. In my head, I heard barely in her teens. And that's why I said ew. And then I was like, wait, she said barely out of her teens. Okay, that's not ew. Yeah. Well, I mean, even still, like, in her teens... If she was back in the day, I mean, it's still gross. Yeah, but I was thinking like 13. That's why I was like, ooh, but no, 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 that's not what you said. So rewind me out of that. (laughs) (laughs) But I don't know. It's just how it was doing. I was like, okay, so what is this going to like come up as? And then it never really developed into anything. And I'm like, okay, so y'all are just making a point of Yeah, why y'all age shaming them? Yeah, I felt like it was like, Doing something bad for Ellie. Like, Ellie did something, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, she married this man, and he was three times her elder, you know? And it's like, I don't know. Anyway. Well, when they got married, they also inherited the chest of drawers. And maybe because she was younger, she put two and two together. And so she put the chest in the attic. But also, they didn't have kids. So I think that's why she just put the chest in the attic and probably was like, well, when we have kids, I'll bring it down and it'll be in their nursery and blah, 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 blah. Well, fast forward a little bit and John Cooley's daughter, Melinda, fell in love. And it was with Sean, this Irishman that they love to point out that too. And I think it's because that kind of goes to show you that John Cooley was not a fan of his. Of course, it's that's exactly what it was doing because heaven forbid. Mm-hmm. 
Well, because John Cooley, her dad, was not a fan, Melinda eloped with Sean, but they didn't have anywhere to go, so she turned to her older brother and sister-in-law for help. Well, John had still been having the good luck, and him and Ellie were living their best lives and had also acquired several plantations in Tennessee. So John and Ellie gave one of the plantations to Sean and Melinda to farm and to oversee, and that's what Melinda was used to. And so she was the perfect wife and raised several children that they had. She worked hard every day, you know, sunrise to sunset, but there was still nothing that she could do to keep Sean happy. He was bored with the farm. He was bored with family life, everything. Well, it had been years since the chest had even been thought of. And one day Ellie was in the attic, saw it, and thought of Melinda and her kids. And maybe she thought it would make her smile, have a piece of home with her in Tennessee. So Ellie sent the chest to Melinda. And within days, Melinda's world came crashing down around her. Sean left for a new life in New Orleans, and she could not handle being without him. She laid in bed for days, which turned into a week, and soon she seemed to not be able to get up at all. She passed away, seemingly from a broken heart, but also exhausted from all of her hard work that she had taken on herself to make Sean happy before, and they said that she was completely gray-haired, completely just an older lady, but she was just in her 30s, but like she just was exhausted. And it seemed like her hard life was part of that curse. But Sean wasn't in the clear either. First of all, good. Because fuck her dad for not being supportive just because he was an immigrant. And so that's why he doesn't like him. Because So fuck that. But, I mean, she, like, gave up everything to be with him. And Mm -hmm. then he's going to fucking be like that and be like, I'm bored with this life. Well, this is the fucking life you chose. Right. You made your bed. (laughs) All I can think about is Beauty and the Beast Belle when she's like, I'm bored with this. Uh, a provincial life? Yes. Well, shortly after Melinda's death, he had a freak accident where he was hit in the head with a steamboat's gangplank. Holy shit. What in the pirate is going on? <laughs> right. And he died immediately. Oh, my God. Okay. So, that's a little extreme. <laughs> well, New Orleans was not good to him, apparently. <laughs> oh, my God. He got, he got a little too, <laughs> too probably. Too aids. <laughs> right? <laughs> but now both parents were dead, and that left their children orphans. So John Cooley had to go to Tennessee. He had to then get the children, and he split them up among family members. And him and Ellie ended up taking the youngest girl, Eliza, back to Kentucky with them. And she enjoyed a great life with them. And when she was 16, she passed a teaching exam and took over a small one-room schoolhouse. And soon she met a man named Malcolm Johnson. They married, and when she was 17, she was given the chest as a wedding gift from Ellie. Because apparently Ellie has not put two and two together, honestly. Clearly, her young age... (laughs) Well, fast forward, Eliza and Malcolm had children, and they also wanted to bestow some of the same opportunities as Eliza was given, and so they adopted an orphan named Arabella. Everything was great with their life. Malcolm was a successful businessman who had built an empire where he owned meals, some real estate, a coal yard, a wharf, and a dry goods store. Damn. Damn. Yeah, so Arabella grew up, and she found the man of her dreams just like Eliza had. Arabella married, had children of her own, and one day Eliza found Arabella's wedding dress. And so she put it away in the chest that hadn't been used in years. You know, it was going to be safe keepings. But shortly after this, Arabella's husband died suddenly. Oh, shit. Then, for some reason, they put Arabella's child's clothes in the chest, and that child passed away soon after as well. Eliza's oldest son was married to Esther. They put her wedding dress in the chest, and she died. And then Eliza had an aunt named Sarah, and she had, like, knitted her son this scarf and glove set for Christmas, And he died tragically while walking along the train trestle where he worked. 
he fell off and died from that fall. And it was just a few days before Christmas. And it's believed that she had kept that gift in the chest. Mm. Then there were two other misfortunes tied to Eliza's immediate family. Her son-in-law deserted his wife after she stored some items in the chest. And then a child was injured in some bizarre accident where the child was left permanently injured. And this was after the child's clothes was stored in the chest. Malcolm died of old age, nothing tragic there. But even though Eliza was set for life, people say that she was kind of like Sarah Winchester, where she was haunted by all the hardships of her immediate family members and the tragedy that surrounded her in some way. And eventually, she sadly died by suicide. Oh, God. Eliza was the 11th victim of the conjure chest. But that wasn't it. Sometime in the early 20th century, Eliza's granddaughter, Virginia Carey Hudson, inherited the chest. It had been years, and she didn't believe anything about the curse. She kind of scoffed at it. And so she had her first child, and she loved this chest. She thought it was beautiful, and the history of her family, you know, it had survived. This is like 150 years. This is amazing. You know, all of this. And she put the baby's clothes in the chest, and lo and behold, the child was born prematurely and died that same day. Oh, God. But that was just tragic luck, right? That doesn't prove the curse is real. She had another child and used the chest again. That child contracted polio. She luckily recovered, but endured related symptoms from polio her entire life. And then Virginia had another daughter, and they stored her wedding dress in there. Well, her husband had to have, like, an emergency surgery, where he then died from an overdose of ether. (gasps) And then another time, Virginia's son was stabbed in the hand at school one day, less than a week after he had put some clothes in that chest. Damn, the turnaround time on this chest sometimes is no joke. Right? I mean, faster than Amazon Prime. (laughs) I mean, honestly, especially uh, COVID times. For real. Well, one of Virginia's friends and neighbor had put his hunting clothes in it, and he was shot during a hunting accident. Sixteen victims all had one thing in common. Some of their personal items, clothing usually, had been put in that chest. So now Virginia couldn't say it was all tall tales. She had felt that loss. And so she wanted to put an end to the curse. She believed it now. So she turned to an African-American woman named Sally who would work for her family Virginia's whole life and was also a confidant with her because she had basically raised Virginia. We all know. We've seen. um, The help. Yes, the help. Why you, You were like right in my brain today. So she asked Sally if she believed in curses and yada, yada, yada. Then she asked if she knew how to reverse one. And Sally said she knew how to reverse this conjure. Three conditions would have to be met and they were going to be weird. First, Virginia would have to be given a dead owl, but it would have to be without her asking. Like, I couldn't be like, man, really need that dead, like really need a dead owl. Wink, 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 you know. Couldn't do that. No prompting. So basically, a friend would have to be like, oh, hey, here's an owl. Cool, bye. You know? Weird. Second, they would need leaves from a willow tree, but it had to be planted by a friend. Like, it had to be given to you unprompted again. What? Right. And so then it also had to have a leaf for every victim. Then the leaves of the willow tree had to be boiled from sunup to sundown, and the dead owl had to be in sight this whole time. Third, the boiled liquid was then poured into a jug and then buried with its handle facing east, and it had to be below a flowering tree. So, a stuffed owl was given to Virginia's son by a friend, So that accomplished the first requirement. And think, like, taxidermy style stuff, not a plush owl. Okay. Well, who just gets a fucking owl? I don't know. I don't know. Well, Virginia plucked leaves from a nearby willow tree, even though, like, that wasn't given 
as a friend, but I don't know. And they boiled them. The owl remained on the kitchen counter the entire time. At dusk, they took the jug, her and Sally, with its handle pointed east and buried it beneath this flowering lilac bush right outside of the kitchen window. And then Sally said, okay, this is how we'll know if the curse has been broken. When the leaves start falling off of the flowering lilac, one of us will die. And Sally died that October 1946. And that was the 17th and the last known victim of the conjure chest. What the fuck? (laughs) Sally sacrificed herself for that. Yeah. That's not fair. I know. No, Sally. I know. Well, Virginia passed it on to her daughter, Virginia. Well, she donated it to the Kentucky History Museum in 1976. And supposedly, you know, the curse has been removed. But safely tucked on the first drawer is an envelope containing owl feathers, supposedly the original ones, don't know for sure, like that they had. I don't know from Sally, from whoever, like from Virginia, she had put these in there. Okay. Like, so I don't know if it was from... Before, like, that would be her yeah, mom, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. But um, then there's a letter saying, you know, like, basically what it is and, like, for protection, keep these in here, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, it's just been on display or put up if they haven't had it on display. But it has not been in the family since then. So on the show... The guy from the museum brings Zach this conjure chest to, like, oogle over. Well, Zach also got a family member, and it's the daughter of the lady who donated it. Her name is Dr. Beverly Kinsley, and she's a retired professor of Harvard's Divinity School. And she said that she was always afraid of it because her mom always told her stories of the curse, but they had it in their house. But it was like, don't touch it, you know, that kind of thing. And she was like, no, I believe in this curse. Like, totally, 100% believe that it has killed my family members before, you know, all the things. Beverly said that her mom would, like, there's, like, glass handles, glass knobs, and her mom would turn them inside out so, like, people couldn't open the drawer, you know, because she was so scared someone would just slide something in there. Yeah. And it would continue. Beverly also said that the handle was to be pointed east because in Christianity, that deals with resurrection and everything. So when they had to bury it with the handle pointed east, like all of that. So I don't know. And then Zach asked both Dr. Beverly and the museum guy if they would like put their jackets in the drawer. And both were like, no. And Zach wouldn't even touch the chest of drawers. Are you surprised? No, of course not. I mean, honestly, though, I don't think I would either. No, hell no, I wouldn't touch it either. But I'm saying, are you surprised he wouldn't? Mr. Dibbick Douche, Mr. (laughs) Am I going to open this Dibbick box? No, he didn't. Four hours fucking later. (laughs) Right. Another thing that made Zach was like, he was like, holy fuck. Because Dr. Beverly said that she remembers her father telling her that her mom told him that she was standing over the chest, you know, like just by it. And she told him, quote, I could see them coming out of there. And she meant like deceased family members, like their spirit. Zach got Dr. Beverly to look at the chest and she looked at the owl feathers and stuff. And she said that it was her mom and her grandmother's handwriting and like how she was saying it. And the museum guy was like, well, that lines up with the letter that your mom sent us talking about the peace and everything. And then they tested it for electromagnetic energy and it seemed to only spike around Beverly. And when she would speak Eliza's name, the meter went crazy. And remember, Eliza is the one who had a lot of tragedy surround her. 
Zach had Beverly read her mom and her grandmother's handwritten notes in the chest while they took full spectrum photos, and they took them in a quick succession. There was this anomaly in one of them, and when they further inspected it, Dr. Beverly was like, is that an owl? (gasps) And they were like, holy shit. And so, you know, it's like, is that an owl or are we making ourselves think it's an owl, but it's only in one thing and they took like six, you know, yeah. bam, 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 bam. And it's like in the middle. It's not just, you know, at the end or whatever. And it is in like a round shape. It has like, so it's like the Venn diagram. Mm-hmm. Think about that. And like, it's like, yeah, it's like three of those circles like overlapping like in this anomaly. Yeah. So it kind of has like a animalistic kind of shape like you can see it especially if you're looking for an owl you can see it but that dr beverly pointed that out was a little bit better than zach pointed it out right but while they were talking about that it looked like an owl all the things you hear this tapping on this chandelier close to him and so it was just kind of like bam 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 stuff going on so it does seem like it still has energy around the chest or more so the family members because it was more around Dr. Beverly. So I don't know. The threat might not be there because the curse seems to be broken. No one has dared to place any clothing in the chest since. So how do we know the curse is broken or not? So you know I'm going to end with a question. Even more than that, would you put... Fuck no. (laughs) A serial killer's closing there? Yes. <laughs> I have some ideas of people's we can test. <laughs> right? Oh, God. That's hilarious. Couldn't even get it out. Fuck no. No. There, no. Absolutely fucking not. Mm-mm. I'm not. No. Do you want me to just, like, fucking play with fire? No. Mm-mm. Me either. But I do know somebody's clothes I would put in there. Oh, shit. You ready for it? Oh, Lord. Yep. Okay. There were a few of y'all in the Facebook group, in the Creepinati Facebook group, and the main Facebook group that recommended this story that has me want to put their clothes in that chest. So, thank you, Sarah, Valeria, and Brenda. So, just to clarify, you want to put the person that you're about to talk about clothes in the drawer, not the people who suggested it? Well, duh. Okay, just making sure. You know I say things stupid. (laughs) Thanks for the suggestion. I want y'all to die. (laughs) (laughs) Not today. (laughs) At least Tiffany's not on here. (laughs) So the story today, tonight, whenever you listen to this episode, is about a serial killer by the name of Delmas Colvin. So Delmas was an over-the-road trucker that, well, by his own accounts, killed Maybe upwards of 47 to 52 women. What? Allegedly. Okay. I don't know. And I'll tell you why as we go into the story. Okay. But I do feel like every serial killer, maybe not everyone, but a lot of serial killers inflate their numbers. Inflate something. Their ego, their dick size, all the things. Well, let's just sound and music this thing and start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. Okay, well, there's not a lot of, like, podcasts and stuff about him. In fact, when I went in Apple Podcasts, because, you know, you can, like, search, like, a topic. So, like, yeah. go in Apple Podcasts and you search Delmas Colvin. There's literally only two podcast episodes that come up about him. One is by this podcast called Fruit Loops, and they had an episode back in... February of 2019. Then in February of 2020, they did an update where they actually interviewed Delmas Colvin and a guy by the name of Phil Chalmers. I think I'm saying it correctly. So what makes him so special is that he actually has a podcast that came out later that year in August of 2020. And y'all, I'm telling y'all, y'all need to check it out. But it's called Where the Bodies Are Buried. The episode that he does on Delmas Colvin is really good. That's the only episode I've listened to, so that's the only one I can speak to. But that one is is really good, where he interviews him. And then Fruit Loops, that podcast, they only cover serial killers of color. So that's 
you know, just like that's a pretty interesting take on true crime. So on the Fruit Loops podcast, though, they talk about how they know they can't find anything on Delmas's background, like as a child. They're like, we looked, we can't find anything. But then on where the bodies are buried, we actually do get a little look into Delmas's childhood. Growing up, his nickname was Heavy, like his actual nickname was Heavy. Delmas is African American and grew up extra large pizza, just like us, hence the nickname Heavy. And which I have to say, we need to do better about recognizing and and he may be totally cool having the nickname heavy. That may not be even be a thing for him, but I think that we need to do better at recognizing that names like that can have the same effect on men that it does on women and that it's not okay to comment on men's size, just like it's not okay to comment on women's size, but that's a soapbox for another day. Just had to throw that out there. So, Delmas grew up with a pretty regular childhood as far as we know. And I'm not going to tell you everything that is said in that Where the Bodies Are Buried podcast because I want you to go listen to it. But, you know, they kind of ask him, like, you know, were you mean to animals? Did you wet the bed kind of thing? And he chuckles and says, you've watched too much Criminal Minds. Like, absolutely not. I had a normal childhood. He said, you know, he played sports. He grew up in Ohio, so he kind of worked farmland type stuff growing up. And he refers to himself as being kind of square. He was a typical kid. If he hurt an animal, it's because he killed it because he hunted it and then he ate it. He didn't hurt animals just to hurt animals. Yeah. Really, the the big thing that happened to him when he was a kid, and, and this is what I think was the catalyst for what he later became was that his father cheated on his mother and they got divorced and his dad took the kids and moved to Ohio. And so from then on, he basically almost never saw his mother again. And his dad remarried. Well, he hated his stepmom. Like, hated her. Mm. Like, he said that that was the first person that he wanted to kill. Damn. And that he thought about killing her, but basically, in his words, he didn't know how he was going to get rid of her fat-ass body. Like, that was his words. Damn. So, And he's like 14 at the time. Yeah. Well, one time when he was a kid, he had a bow and arrow, and he was playing with his brother with it, showing him how to shoot it. And when his brother was trying to shoot it, it kind of went crazy. The arrow went through the window and shot the cabinet beside where his stepmom was cooking. And she swore, she just knew that it was Delmas that yeah. shot that arrow. And she was like, he's trying to kill me. Oh my gosh. He just let her believe it because he hated her so much that he wanted her to be that scared of him. Yeah. Yeah. When Delmas was about 23 or 24 is when he says that he killed his first victim. It was 1987, and at the time, he was a cab driver. And he picked up Donna Lee White. What? <laughs> I know. I know. And, like, a couple of things referred to her as Donna Lee, which is what I call little Donna over here. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is too, this is too real. Oh I don't gosh. like it. I don't like it. I can't write that. Like, I can't, you know. Yeah. I don't like it. What the fuck? Also, that reminds me that I always used to have to be Miss White when we played Clue with me and Tiffany, because we'd play Clue by ourselves, because she would be Miss Scarlet, because she was all sexy and shit in the old Clue. <laughs> and Miss White was an old fucking maid. And I'd have to be her. And now you're always Colonel Mustard? I'm Colonel Mustard, yeah. <laughs> like, why couldn't you be somebody else? I don't know. That's just how it was when we were kids. We had our roles, but now it's Donnelly White. That's weird. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Tiffany was mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very clear on whether or not this was the very first time he ever met Donna or if this, is, this was something that had happened multiple times. And from what I gather... Donna was a sex worker, which doesn't matter, but it speaks to his pattern. 
So Donna and Delmas were hanging out, drinking, hooking up. And he says that he left for a little while. And when he came back, Donna had OD'd on cocaine. So his story is like, I wasn't sure if she was dead, but then he was like, I knew she was still alive. So, okay. Right. Well, and he was dealing drugs at the time. So I'm kind of pretty sure it was his drugs that she was doing. Yeah. And so he's not going to be like, dee dee boop boop boop, 911. And I'm pretty sure the Good Samaritan law wasn't in place here anyway. Mm hmm. Because at least here in Mississippi, I don't know about other places, but in Mississippi, if someone's ODing, don't leave them, call because you're protected from the Good Samaritan law. You know what I mean? Like you're not going to go to jail because you're getting high with them. Like you're protected because you're taking care of them. Well, of course, he's not going to do any of that because he's a shit human. Instead, he puts a plastic bag over her head and strangles her and suffocates her with the plastic bag. Then he rolls her body up in this carpet and like carries her out of the house. Here's the kicker. The landlord held the door open for him as he moved the body and like offered to help him carry it to the truck. Oh my gosh. I mean, is that not just, like, a fucking, like, movie moment? Yes. Holy Hannah. So, he dumps the body, which was later found in Atlantic City on September 15th, 1987. Her death was ruled as acute intoxication from cocaine. Because there was no signs of, like, her, Mm. like, the strangulation, I guess. I guess it's because maybe he didn't strangle her as much as it was just the suffocation. I don't really know. And this part is really fuzzy to me, and I honestly, I could not find anything else on this. But he was actually picked up and, like, arrested about her death for tampering with evidence and hindering apprehension. How? Why? I don't fucking know. I don't know whatever came of it, but he ended up like never being like convicted of anything. Wow. And just got the fuck out of it. Wow. And they ruled her death as an OD. Wow. Well, then we get a little bit of a span where we know he doesn't commit any murders because he went to prison in 1989 on an assault charge and a weapons violation, which I found nothing on. He was sentenced three to 15 years, and this was in Ohio. He was released on parole in 1992. And then in 1993, he went back to prison for violation of parole on a drug charge and stayed in prison until 1996. So basically, aside from that time when he was in prison, he was an over-the-road truck driver that dabbled as a drug dealer, but also as like a truck stop pimp with a couple of sex workers that were like in his rotation. But that's just kind of what I've gathered from bits of that podcast and bits of news articles. I'm, I'm not very clear. It talked about him and somebody named Robin, who I gathered was his girlfriend, who, like, helped him organize the sex workers and stuff, but didn't know anything about the murders and was, like, completely shocked when he was arrested for murders, but did know about the sex trafficking aspect of his life. So, but I couldn't find anything on who this Robin person was, so I don't know. But basically, before... And after that time he was in prison, he was this truck driver who had access to a plethora of victims and dumping grounds. And what he would do is, of course, he targeted victims who would be less likely to be reported missing. So women who were sex workers, who lived a more transient lifestyle, who had issues with drug abuse, that type of thing that kept them on the move. And then... He would kill them through strangulation, 
and then would put a bag over their head to make sure they were dead, would strip them of their clothes and all. So, of course, by strangulation, there's no evidence in his truck because there's no blood or anything to clean up. And then he would dump their bodies in a different place than he picked them up. And then he would take their clothes and dump their clothes in like a third location. So pick them up in location one, dump their bodies in location two, dump their clothes in a dumpster in location three. So, I mean, the odds of finding someone that's, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like a stranger on stranger crime like that is very difficult to solve. We know, period. Much less when you have no evidence like that. Are you kidding? What are the odds of even identifying the victims half the time, much less, you know, I mean, think about if you rolled up on a dumpster and you saw someone's clothes in there. Okay, there's clothes in a dumpster. You're going to move on. There's no blood on them. There's nothing there to make you think, oh, but that's a murder victim's clothes. You know, you should be like, oh, oh, somebody threw their clothes away. Yeah, that's scary to think about. So scary to think about. Golly. Makes you wonder how many clothes have you seen? How many? Yeah. Well, you remember how I said that he, if you ask him, you know, he's got 40 to 50 victims. Wasn't until the 2000s that bodies really started turning up and things kind of started imploding for Delmas. So I know this story has a lot of names, but I'm going to try to put all the pieces together. In January of 2000, the skeletal remains of Valerie Jones, who was only 38 years old, were found in a landfill. So Delmas had basically lured Valerie into his truck and then strangled her and then dumped her body in Lake Erie. I don't know how he lured her. I don't know if it was drugs, if it was money for sex. I don't know how. Then, on August 5th of 2000, a man was walking his dog in South Toledo, and he stumbles upon skeletal remains. And these turn out to be 40-year-old Dorothea Wetzel. Sometimes Dorothea would go by the last name Oviedo, but her nickname was Angel. She, sorry, she was also a sex worker, and her remains were found wrapped in a blanket, and just like Valerie, they were in a very, like, a desolate area. And then one month later, in September of 2000, Jacqueline Thomas, a 42-year-old, was found on the roadside. And then in 2002, Lily Summers, who was just 43, was found in a tractor trailer. Then, in 2003, Delmas, the piece of shit that he fucking is, killed Jackie Simpson. This is one thing that I'm going to tell you that was said on Where the Bodies Are Buried podcast because this pissed me off so bad. Okay, so he was in this motel with Jackie, and apparently she was annoying him. He said... All the time she was there, she was crying about her mama, her creepy uncle, and fuck, I don't care nothing about that. I got tired of her fucking whining, so he smothered her with a pillow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Honestly, though, I could see you doing that if you were a serial killer. Well, I mean, don't annoy me. I mean, but that would be your reasoning. If I was a serial killer, but I'm not. Yeah. So he kept her body... In his truck for months. Why? I don't know. I don't know. He must have went nose blind to it. (laughs) I wish I could see my face. He did say one time something about like would keep plastic up for the smell. But then one thing I read said like at times he would keep bodies in there for months like until they are mummified but i don't understand how the little plastic would keep the smell like that makes no sense to me but this is the kicker about this though so when her body was like in the truck mummifying 
he was going through a divorce. And, of course, he is really good at playing the victim. And so, woe is him. He was going through this divorce. And he says that he had to go to this court date on a burglary charge because his ex-wife was saying that he stole from her because he took all the money out of the account. Whatever. You know there's more to that story. Mm -hmm. He probably really stole from her, but whatever. So, he had to go to court on a burglary charge. Okay? So, if they would have convicted him, he would have gone to prison for like 18 months. So, he's like going to court. Wow. With this fucking body in this truck. So, like, what would have happened if he'd have been convicted? Exactly. They would have found the body and been like, well, you have more time. Or would it have been one of those, like, okay, you're convicted, like, come back Monday and start your sentence. I don't know. But either way, like, he's chancing this. Yeah. Like, with a fucking body in wow. his truck. Wow. Then, on May 9, 2003, Melissa Weber, who was 39, her body was found under a couch in this vacant trucking terminal. So her body was wrapped in this purple comforter that had been bound with strips of bed sheets, and the linens were tagged with the logo of the Toledo Budget Inn. And so that's like a little bit of a lead for police. Then Lily Summers, who was 43, her body was found April 8th, 2002. So sorry, I kind of reverse those dates, but you get the point. So a lot of these happened around the Toledo area, but it's like, well, what led police to Delmas? Well, there was a sex worker who Delmas had actually attacked, but this girl was so fucking smart. She said that during the assault, she urinated on the bed sheets because she knew that he was going to kill her and she wanted to leave as much DNA and as much evidence in the cab of his truck as possible. So if it ever came back to him, they would be able to prove that she was there. So she peed all over his bed trying to leave evidence. How fucking smart is that? That's some MacGyver shit right there. Right. But she memorized all this stuff about the cab of his truck and everything, but she ended up surviving. She went straight to police. Police were able to do a rape kit and get DNA. When they ran the DNA, they hit pay dirt. They got a match from Melissa Weber. So when they did her forensic analysis of her remains, they had some fingernail clippings that had DNA under them. And it was a match for Delmas. And it matched the DNA that they had found on Jackie Simpson's body. And it matched like an unknown rape case from like 1998. So to kind of make a long story short about the trial, they ended up arresting him and taking him to trial for Jackie and Melissa. And they were seeking the death penalty. And just like all these other fucking criminals, fucking terrified of the death penalty. So just three days into the trial, they brought the jurors in and they were like, thank you for your service, but go home because they had reached a plea deal. He ended up pleading guilty for the murders of Valerie Jones, Dorothea Wetzel, Jacqueline Thompson, Lily Summers, Jackie Simpson, Melissa Weber, And then he also pled guilty and told them about him killing Donna Lee White back in the 80s. So he got multiple life sentences in Ohio. Then they extradited him back to New Jersey for Donna Lee White's murder. And I think he got like 30 years for that. So now he's in Ohio serving, you know, two life sentences without the possibility of parole. And now he's kind of talking, like not talking, but kind of talking like he's making it sound like he's killed all these people and he'll say he'll talk, but he's not going to talk about states with a death penalty. So 
They're trying to kind of use his fuel logs to compare about missing persons and cold cases that are unsolved and all of that. Yeah. But he's not going to talk about any case in any state that has a death penalty because he's already worked it out in Ohio where he's got it a life sentence. He's not going to risk that anywhere else because he is terrified of the death penalty. But can easily take other people's lives. Oh, in where the bodies are buried, they did like a little update thing. I like quit listening to it because it pissed me off so bad because he gets COVID or he thinks he does. I think he actually had it. But he is like flipping his lid. He like wants him to like call the infirmary and bitch them out because he didn't get any medicine all night and he was sweating and he couldn't breathe and all this stuff. And I'm like, you couldn't breathe. Wow. You strangled people. Yeah. But you couldn't breathe. Wow. My heart's breaking for you, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's breaking in half. Right. I'm crying for you. I mean, obviously, um, I support humane treatment of prisoners and that they should get the care they need in the infirmary. But, oh, you have COVID and you can't breathe? Yeah, like literally how you killed people cutting off their air supply and you're whining about it. I mean, meanwhile, there's tons of people in this world with COVID who can't breathe as well. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not saying he shouldn't get the care. I'm saying cry me a fucking river. Well, one thing he did do, though, was on where the bodies are buried, he told where he dumped a body. Oh, shit. I just have to say, Donna, he talked about a girl with dishwater blonde hair. Oh, Lord. So I'm just going to just say that I'm right, that people say dishwater blonde hair. He's a serial killer, Carrie. But I'm just going to say that I'm not the only one that says dishwater blonde hair. That's a terrible, terrible thing. Like, you would not go to the salon and be like, I want dishwater. Well, no, but I'm just saying it's a thing. I I know. Okay, so he tells them in this location named LaSalle that... I mean, he goes into very specifics. It was this rainy night, and and he, I mean, there's a truck stop with the ditch, with the this, with the that. I mean, very, very specific places of where this body is buried. And, you know, Phil says, okay, so if I go there, I'm going to find a body. He says, well, you're not going to find a body. You're going to find remains because there ain't no body there. It's remains. So, of course, they call the proper authorities. And, I mean, this is, I'm talking like, this is like August 2020. Okay, so they do a search. They have the cadaver dogs out there, and it is so hot that the cadaver dogs are struggling. So they have to like call it off for a little while. Yeah, but they finally, you know, get through the search, and they actually find two small pieces of bone. Mm. And they're like, "Oh my fuck! Did we just find? I mean, holy shit! We just fucking found another victim." They keep looking and keep looking. But they didn't find anything, so they call. They didn't find anything else, so they called the search off, and come to find out, it's not human remains. It's uh. it's not or it's not human bones. So they've called the search off, and that's the most recent thing I have found, and that was from October of 2020, and that's the most recent article I could find on the alleged remains that he told. You know, yeah. So. As of October, the search was called off, and those were not human bones. Wow. So I don't know if he sent him on a wild goose hunt or chase or whatever, (laughs) or if he had the location wrong. I mean, he was pretty fucking specific. Wow. I mean, he was pretty fucking specific. I mean, on what everything about the story was specific. But, I mean, really, that's all we know. I mean, he's talking, but I think he also wants to get paid to talk and... You know, yeah. I mean, he wants his. He, I mean, I'm sure he wants, you know. I mean, he's he's a serial killer in prison. He's not going to just do it for shits and giggles. He's going to want something out of it. And he's right. Gonna, he's going to play a game and that you're going to have to play. And, I mean, we all watch Mindhunter. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. So, how many people did he kill? I don't know. Do I think it was that many? No. Do I think it's more than we know? Yeah. But I also think it's interesting that, like, the bodies didn't start coming up till the 2000s, you know? And they're really all around Toledo. 
I mean, he really did kill in his geographical comfort area. Yeah. Aside from the one in Atlantic City. But he does talk a lot about how good of a dumping ground New Jersey is because it's so wooded. So are there a bunch of bodies in New Jersey that we don't know about? Maybe. I don't know. Wow. But, you know, what's interesting is, like, the FBI really does say, like, the number one or, like, the best profession for, like, a serial killer is an over-the-road truck driver. Yeah. I mean, it's so bizarre that it's like this club. And it, I really think some of them know each other, you know? Because, again, again, I don't want to tell everything that's in that podcast, but he does tell a story of an interaction with a guy that it's like a little, like, a nod your head, like, yeah. Sup, I know what's up. You know, there's more to the story that I'm not going to tell you because I want you to go listen. But Yeah. Because it's not fair to tell you everything. But. Yeah. Like evil knows evil. Yes. He is pretty adamant that he didn't have sex, like, with the corpses, with the, you know. I couldn't really get if he raped the women before he killed them. Mm. So, I don't know, like. For him, the way he says it, just the the killing itself was the pleasure. But I don't know. I, I kind of get the feeling like, I, I don't want to oversimplify it. Like, oh, he's killing his stepmother over and over and over again. You know, I don't yeah. know that it's that simple, but I don't know. So I, don't, I just don't know where the sex component comes in. Because some, it seems like some of them had DNA, like Jackie. So did he just have sex with her before and then killed her? Or did he rape all of them? You know, I don't right, know. yeah. Because sometimes he would even say, like, with some of the women, he would, like, pay them, and then they would want more, and then that's when he would kill them. You know, and mm-hmm. so it's like, so the ones that he did have sex with, did he pay them for sex, and then they wanted more, so that's why his DNA. But also, if you hear him talk he talks about how he didn't have time for sex workers that he was out there making money and that he didn't have he didn't give sex workers any time you know like he wasn't out there looking for that he wasn't out there trying to have sex with sex workers because he was out there making money it's like so which one was it did yeah. you have sex with sex workers and they wanted more money and so you ha- you had to strangle them or were you out there making money and you weren't studying sex workers or maybe, like, they worked for him and they wanted more money. But he was saying he had sex with them. He said that for sure. Yes. Oh, okay. He just talks out of both sides of his mouth. Which, yeah. duh. I mean, because he wants to make himself look better and, you know, I mean, especially, I mean, he's in he's in fucking prison. He, I mean, he's going to want to look better so that he has some street cred in prison, too. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's going to be there for his whole life. Like, he's got to make his life easier, you know. So that's the story of Fuckface Delmas. Damn. It really is scary how normal and, like, ordinary these people are. Mm -hmm. You know, that you see truckers on the road all the time. And, you know, like, oh, my gosh, they could have a body. And anyone could. That's a thing. Anyone could have a body in their car. Mm -hmm. He got stopped. And there was a dead person in the back. He's so much of a fucking sociopath that he was... Calm, cool, and collected, and the police officer never knew the difference. Yeah. I have too much anxiety to be a serial killer. Which is why you're not, though. Yeah. Because you couldn't be. Because you have no. you have that. They He doesn't. Yeah. Oh, God. Which is why he's a sociopath. I have too much nervous belly. I'd never make it to my destination on time because I'd have to stop and shit so much. Hell yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, I hope they can match up more of the stuff and kind of see if he's telling the truth with mm-hmm. the missing persons and his fuel logs and all of that or kind of be like no you're you're a bullshitter yeah well y'all tell us what you think is he inflating his numbers or is he legit and would you put his clothes in that chest yes or do you have someone's clothes <laughs> Or do you believe in the chest? Let us know. Yeah, let us know. And is it a chest of drawers or a chest of drawers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Do you know how hard that was for me to say chest of drawers? 
I mean, I don't even know how old I was when I learned it was chest of drawers. Right? It made sense. When you learn it, it's a chest of drawers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because forever, it never made sense to me. I mean, Chester, who's Chester? Right. Why's he got drawers? (laughs) I mean, why do we care about his underwear? (laughs) Thank y'all so much for listening. Don't forget to like and review and subscribe and all the things. And remember, creep it real and and don't don't get scared. scared.